Well, thanks for joining us. And uh, I don't know if you're like me. I'm a little tired after that leap day yesterday. That once every four years stuff is just pretty hard on an older guy. Um, going to try to get through uh, today's call. Uh, I've got about 40 different uh, slides. And again, this will be uh, recorded. If uh, any of you have insomnia and need to listen to it again or something, you're sure welcome to. Uh, but thanks for all of uh, the existing and new members that are on uh, tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, I hope these are of value to you. They're really fun and uh, really makes me realize how fast time flies when we're doing these once a month and it just seems like we were just here. So let's go ahead and get started and, and again, thank you for being on the call. As a reminder, uh, Kimball Charting Solutions is not a bull or a bear shop. Uh, I, I truly believe that being bullish uh, or bearish is nothing more than a psychological state of mind, and we're trying to apply strategies to the to the markets. But uh, just kind of always a reminder, our goal is to uh, to attempt to help all of you and ourselves enlarge our portfolios regardless of, of market direction. So as we get started here, I just kind of want this the word focus came to mind. If you'll uh, think back on last Friday's uh, Thursday Friday's uh, sector uh, sentiment commodity extreme report, and also the coffee with uh, Chris over the weekend, it had one particular focus, and that focus was on the crude oil markets. Uh, very humbly, I'm surprised to see how much crude oil fell, uh, and that the S and P didn't go along with it. It's essentially we'll look at it uh, chop sideways, you know, for the last couple of years. But the whole reason for last Friday's uh, Thursday Friday's sentiment report focus on crude oil and the coffee with Chris is that if uh, crude oil would happen to hit a low here, there's just several interesting uh, patterns and sentiment that uh, we're of the belief that if crude oil can it, it just settle down, trade sideways, and if it can move higher. Um, you know, our belief that we've been sharing since last week is that uh, it could be positive for stocks and uh, is um, today's upside action in the stock solely attributable to crude oil? And the answer is no, but it, it sure helps and there's some positive things taking place. So uh, we're going to see some more on crude oil here and, uh, you know, when one of the most important, if not the most important uh, commodity on the planet is hitting dual 25 and 30 year support after the largest decline in its history over a, an 18 month to two year period that really gets my attention to watch for some reversal potential. So this uh, this guy's characterization kind of reminds me of this past month. Um, as I was telling Emily here with me that uh, uh, monthly charts are more important to me than weekly and weekly charts are more important to me than daily. But the reason this uh, gentleman kind of to me describes or the visual is, has a lot to do with last month as, you know, during the month on an intraday basis, five-year rising support was traded below uh, a, a few days a couple of weeks ago. By week's end, it uh, closed, the major markets closed above support and the same thing on a monthly basis. So this just kind of reminds me of, uh, whew, it was kind of close and uh, nothing's completely decided but there's some been some positive action that, that we'll look at. But this is uh, our global nine pack. We're looking at the world. I don't have labels, everybody, but you know, if you want to relook at it or hit pause, you can see the names of all of the products. Uh, we've got the Dow in the upper left, S and P in the middle in the top row, and then mid caps. Russell on the left middle row, Wilshire 5000, Value Line Geometric, and then the lower is Europe with Germany on the left, London in the middle, and France on the right. And the key is, you'll notice uh, the continuation of the global look-alike patterns. Uh, you'll notice uh, all of these charts uh, that we're looking at right now uh, are monthly. We had the close, obviously, of uh, February uh, yesterday. And you'll notice that the majority of these had what we want to call uh, a reversal pattern or from a candlestick pattern. It looks like a bullish wick took place on the majority, the majority of these uh, indices at five-year rising support. Now I've cut the left side off. I apologize, everybody, on you know each of these charts. Uh, but to get the whole five years in, then you couldn't see really what took place. You know this month, we started last summer uh, beating the drum hard when August was down hard. That the world's uh, stock markets remained above uh, of above support on a five-year basis, and so we're still there uh, at this time on March the first after the close of February. But the last two months, as you can see, January and February, and almost all of these, 
uh, twice the markets tried to break the five-year rising support lines and so far they've failed as, as the majority of them are above support. The only one uh, that's really uh, significantly below everybody is uh, uh, France down here in the, the lower right that has broke uh, you know, its channel. But from the, the, the key indices, five-year rising supports still in play. I noticed yesterday morning, uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway is having this meeting. Warren Buffett was on CNBC, so I just put my TV on pause and, and, and pulled out my smartphone and took a picture. But the reason I did is, you know, I really admire uh, Warren in, in many ways. But his comment caught my attention, and you can see in the upper left is that he didn't know how uh, what the long-term effects of, of low rates are. And humbly, do you know what the long-term effects of low rates will be on the majority of asset classes? I don't know. I, you know we all have suspicions, and we have different roadmaps and blueprints or macro uh, ways that we think this will go. But I, I'm still really stuck on the, on this. Everybody is that I believe that all of us are unwilling participants in the largest financial experiment you know in the world, and just essentially you know what's the coded message of what's Warren saying? I don't know what's going to come out of this experiment. And, and I still don't, uh, but you know, one of the things uh, we'll talk about you know, later on for a couple of minutes is you know, the, the phrase of, um, that a lot of people during the month of February, and especially January and mid-February, said the markets are misbehaving. I don't believe that markets do misbehave. That's just a coded message that they were on the wrong side of the trade. And so um, I, I think, there's, as I've tried to share for months, I believe unbelievable uh, excitement coming forward. Uh, whether it's Hillary or Donald, we'll find out a, a lot tonight from Super Tuesday, uh, you know, in the elections. But opportunities, I don't think, have ever been been greater. A lot of uh, coils are, are are wound. You know, when you think about seeing commodities down five years in a row, and that's never happened somewhere along the line, that's going to reverse and, and provide some opportunities. And, and that may be even closer uh, uh, than further away as far as some of the opportunities in that complex. So I find a lot of things exciting right now. But I'm not trying to say that I have any idea uh, three and five years from now how this grand experiment is going to turn out, other than I believe it will uh, provide volatility and that uh, all of us have uh, access to tools that can make money uh, regardless of which, this, which way that these major markets head. Uh, one of the things is, uh, you know, have you got any trouble with insomnia? Obviously, listening to me or watching this webinar will probably do something about it, but if, if you just really want some punishment, I was really honored this past uh, week with Sean with StockTwits, uh, gave me a call last week, and they're doing interviews with different people. So there's uh, this web address, soundcloud.com forward slash StockTwits forward slash Chris Kimball. Um, there's a, Sean did an absolutely great job of uh, interviewing many people that are way above my pay grade. I was really honored to be on the list. So if, if you're really bored, insomnia, and you want to listen to some other philosophical things, uh, and just some thoughts about Sir John. Uh, feel free to to go there. Uh, there's no charts. It's just uh, audio. It's a podcast. But again, I was really honored. And uh, if you want some punishment? You want to hear some more of me? That'd be the place to go. So let's uh, kind of look at uh, what we just uh, went through. This is the majority of uh, commodity uh, assets on the left side. The S and P is snuck right here, uh, almost in the middle. So the column is ranked, uh, the first column we're going to look at on uh, month to date performance, which is the month of February. And so they're going to be color coded in, in this column ranked as far as performance. Everything else is going to be mixed that you're going to see, but the color codes will still remain the same. Obviously the gold miners were the stellar uh, for the month of February. Uh, gold, uh, you can see, had a good month, up almost 11%. Silver up 4 Faded off uh, after you know the first four or five into just some uh, fairly normal uh, cluster of uh, not many high returns. And then you notice to get into the red side, uh, natty gas, uh, gasoline, and oil, uh, and carbon. You know were, were hit pretty hard still on the month uh, the month of February itself. So we're going to un uncover then the year to date numbers. So essentially, you know, uh, the first column we looked at is just the month of February. So now we've got a 60-day return. You can see the GDX is still at the top, and this is where the color coding. So you can see like the, the next best performance from a, a dark color would be gold. Then you can see silver is right in there, and then your worst would uh, have been carbon. You can see that uh, natty gas still hit pretty hard. So then we'll go to look at the 52-week, and so this is interesting me to you know uh, what's really happened uh, over the last year, damage-wise, and then here's the last 90 days. So the 90-day may be my favorite column. Uh, 
uh, you can obviously pause this you know, in the future and look back over it. If any of you like this table, we uh, include these in uh, our weekly reports. But the 90-day interests me you know, a lot as far as um, miners are hot, gold's been hot, so you always want to look at potentials for inflection or turnaround points there. And then obviously the, the commodity with the oil complex, that's where you're seeing a lot of this red, and so there's some potential for turnaround candidates there that we'll look at. So potential uh, short discussions later in the call on some of the things that have been hot, looking at uh, longing some of the things that have been hit the hardest over the last 90 days to one year. So as I saw this picture, you know, you look at this bike rider, you, I just kind of think it's just probably not going to end real well for the guy. But, um, you know, just some basic comments. You know, many markets have fallen hard over the past year. I'm not telling you anything new. Particularly, uh, stock indices would have been hit the least hard with the commodities, obviously, the most uh, being hit or run over almost uh, the most of any degree. Uh, our trend reversals in plays and uh, have the markets hit rock bottom. So we're going to discuss uh, several of these things in, in today's you know, webinar. Just real quickly, on a global six-pack, we have the S&P in the upper left, 30-year yield in the middle, crude oil in the upper right, gold in the lower left, U.S. dollar in the middle on the lower row, and the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen. So just some really quick basic comments, and they're going to drill into each of these, but you can see S&P is still on the five-year rising channel. But essentially, it's done nothing more than trade in a horizontal two-year channel, uh, and that we're closer to the bottom of the two-year channel than the top, just bouncing off five-year. 30-year yield interest me. This is a um, almost a 10-year chart, everyone, that you'll notice this blue Other than here, that they blew below it. Now, this is a monthly chart. All of these are monthly, everybody. Uh, went below it on a one-month basis and then came back. So yields are back at uh, long-term support going back to 2008. And then you'll notice on a monthly basis there was a pretty good size um, reversal wick from a bullish reversal wick at support. Uh, we'll discuss later on that we are uh, long yields and short bonds. And this is uh, one of the major uh, reasons why. Moving on to crude oil, the two uh, blue lines coming in are 25 and 30 year support lines tied to monthly closing prices. You can see the financial crisis came down here and touched it, bounced really sharp off of there. We're going to drill right into inside this, uh, this box, but we crude has experienced two monthly reversal bullish wicks uh, in a row at 25 and 30 year support. Uh, so we started talking about this 30 days ago at the Connect series. So it's been a very interesting 30 days and what that could mean for potentially stock prices uh, running through the idea of sell in May and go away. In other words, you're long from November to May. So uh, crude oil, if it can uh, have some continued positive action here at support, could help probably the seasonal trade you know, potentially for the next uh, 90 to 120 days. Uh, gold uh, remains in a downtrend. Uh, you can see this nice rally this past month took it up to falling resistance. U.S. dollar basically had a, a huge rally for about 18 months. Then over the last year, everybody, uh, again this is a monthly chart, has chopped sideways uh, below the 100 level and essentially above 93. So it's stuck in a 7% uh, percent range either way and obviously what King Dollar does coming out of this pattern is going to influence a lot of trades. Lastly, in the lower right is the U.S. dollar yen. Uh, what this line coming in is a 25-year resistance line. And you'll notice that stocks have a high correlation uh, with the yen. So what happens, uh, excuse me, I'll go back to that. What happens um, if, if the yen bottom line folks can break above uh, this line, which is like at the 125 level, very bullish for stocks. So uh, bullish for stocks in a breakout and uh, bearish or soft news for stocks if the U.S. dollar yen uh, falls. So let's take a, a closer look. Speaking of the U.S. dollar yen, we're just going to look at the yen right here. We started advocating several months ago that it has a potential that the yen was forming an inverse head and shoulders pattern. This lower line uh, coming in here, folks, is a 25-year support line. So it looks like we have an inverse head and shoulders and the dotted line being the neckline. So you'll notice once it started heading up in December, what did we see in stocks around the world? We saw weakness. So we started sharing a couple of weeks ago, and this is a weekly chart 
that we thought the yen had got ahead of itself and it hit resistance, and then we thought the yen was due to back off, which should push stocks higher. So uh, our, the ideal situation for if this is a head and shoulders, the ideal uh, pattern would be for the yen to fall, come back down in here to the 85, 86 zone, and test the neckline as support. And um, if it continues to do that, fall another two or three percent, um, we should see a rally, you know, in stocks. Then the key play is what's going to happen at this neckline test. If the neckline would fail, and this was just a giant fake out, and the yen breaks below 85 and moves towards 80, that'd be very good news for stocks. If the neckline holds and the yen would then push higher and start breaking above 90, then the five-year trends uh, around the five-year rising trend channel support around the world will be put to a test or break. So what the yen does going forward, obviously, uh, again, this is weekly, so you can see one reversal wick uh, almost a month ago, and then here was uh, last week, and then this is uh, obviously just one day, uh, two days, excuse me, end of the week, but so far we have weakness in the yen, and that's why part of the reason we saw stocks uh, strongly rally across the board today. So this is, again, one of our just uh, key, key charts is what this Japanese yen does. So we're going to drill into some of our charts. This is the S&P monthly. You'll notice in the month of January that I have my arrow under. There was a large wick tried to break the five-year channel. And then this past month, uh, we see quite a, a reversal pattern. And that would be a bullish reversal a pattern at five-year support. So essentially, a five-year trend is up. Two-year trend is sideways. We had dual support meet here and so far on two monthly tests, uh, a, a positive uh, for sure is that support has held and we see some positive action you know, at rising support. This uh, looks at sentiment. Uh, the blue line is uh, smart money and the red line is dumb. And the key I highlighted in the green boxes is when you see start smart money very high and you see this huge spread between smart and dumb money, that's typically when the market is uh, at a low or has a chance sentiment-wise to rally. And I just highlighted since 2011 three different time frames where you saw a large spread between the blue and the red, between smart and dumb money. The reason I'm just highlighting it is you see a few, uh, three different times, the low in 2011 and in 14 and last year in 15, and we saw then quite a wide spread, you know, again. So uh, from a sentiment perspective, uh, the decline that we saw um, got people a, a little nervous, a little sweaty armpitted, and so there, there are some extremes going on. Uh, close to some of the, the uh, largest extremes since 2011, you know, right here. So that shouldn't be a surprise then to see some bullish reversal patterns taking place with sentiment uh, that far apart. One of the one of my favorite indicators, um, you know, since uh, the late 1990s has been junk bonds. And so one of the things that I'm looking at this is a Pimco's high yield fund. Uh, you know, the ETFs, folks, um, with J&K and HYG, they don't have much history behind them time-wise. So you always kind of see me referring to one of several. Uh, you know, I look at PIMCO and Fidelity and Putnam's high-yield bond funds because they've been around uh, for now the last 20 years. And so we can really do some uh, long-term charting and get perspective. But just kind of one of the reasons that... Uh, um, I wanted to kind of go backwards, you know, first you'll notice I put this red slash because we were seeing a divergence that high yields were making lower highs while the market in the late 90s was making higher highs, so you saw that divergence. Typically, uh, high yields, junk bonds don't throw off too many false signals. They do uh, help us in the long-term trend. You know, when you see something like this, you either want to shorten your time frame lower your, uh, your slow money exposure because you know that uh, historically when you see this type of a weakness, stocks tend to struggle. But the th one thing that catches my eyes, look on the flip side. Now this is a monthly chart that you'll notice right here in 2002 that you saw a double bottom in the high yields before you saw a double bottom in the S&P. So they were a leading indicator in the late 90s that a top was in. They were also a leading indicator that a bottom one was in in 2002. So let's watch what happened after that. So we, look, we rolled forward four or five more years. 
And you'll notice here we started seeing a divergence of lower highs in 2007, and you continue to see higher highs and higher lows in the S&P, but this was a diverging message. Then we saw the financial crisis took place, 50% decline in the S&P. But notice what we see again here, friends, is that on a monthly basis, you had a series of a double bottom and higher lows before the S&P on a monthly basis ever bottomed. So again, we saw a, a sell signal or a divergence at the highs of 2007 and then an, a, a bullish message at the lows. So if you applied, um, it's not on this chart, but just go look at it for yourself and I'll show it again sometime. But it's interesting that a buy signal took place from a moving average and a resistance line breakout in October of 2008, and the low in the S&P that really there was no looking back was in March of 2009. So high yields gave a positive divergence signal almost five months ahead of time in the lows of the financial crisis. So now we'll uh, roll forward. We'll notice uh, in 2014, we started seeing a divergence of lower highs in the high yield complex while the, the market was still moving higher. So we've seen a negative divergence, you know, there. So not enough time has went by. You know, in the 2002 lows, we saw a double bottom on a monthly basis. 2008, we did the same. We do see so far uh, continued falling prices uh, closed out the month essentially flat. This uh, in the upper left up here would be the PIMCO fund, and if you'll notice, uh, looks like for the month it closed flat. So there would probably be almost a, a doji star if you would look at this fund or a fund or a reversal. Um, this would be an argument that bulls would love to hear is um, what if this, everyone, is an inverse head and shoulders on a multi-year basis with the left shoulder in 2002, the head in 2009, and the right shoulder in 2016, which is at the same level as 2002. This is far, far from being proven, but um, you know, one of the main talk is that the, uh, junk, the junk bond managers loaded up in the energy complex a couple of years ago. They have an overexposure to that area, so think about this. If that overexposure has caused high yields to fall further than maybe what they would have if there wasn't such a concentration of the energy sector, let's play a game of what if. What if the energy sector would happen to be bottoming? If so, that would probably be positive for this, uh, the exposure to the uh, energy complex inside the junk bonds. And this has me very much interested in potentially, um, we'll, we'll look at uh, either J&K or HYG later in the webinar, but uh, if we get a break of uh, falling resistance, this could actually, could actually be a conservative way that any of you could play stocks because uh, essentially, you know, junk bonds are uh, what I want to call stocks and drag. They imitate the S&P, but you get a much higher coupon yield. And uh, don't quote me, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these funds aren't paying five to 700 basis points in dividends. So that would be a cushion to almost get a half a percent per month in yield just to protect some of the principal. So we'll look at that uh, at a later date. Um, but really important price point for high yields. Uh, what we want, would want to see from a, a positive uh, stock market action would see the high yields start to, to move higher. And obviously, ideal would be another double bottom like we saw. If we see continued weakness here, it would be at the same continued message to, uh, that to risk off uh, would be the trade. Wanted to, to move on here to the, uh, I've been sharing this uh, frequently. This is a couple of long-term moving averages, nothing to hide. You got the 200-day moving average or 40 weeks, and then uh, the 100-day the moving average would be 20 weeks on a weekly basis. The uh, red line is quicker. It's a 17-week moving average. So this is what I just call the, the combo of looking for a crossover in moving averages and a break of support. So in 2000, in the year 2000, you saw a moving average crossover and the S&P break multi-year support. That was a sell signal. This doesn't give combo sell, buy or sell signals very often. Then you can see in 2003, you had a crossover to the upside, and then the S&P broke resistance, and you had a multi-year rally. Then you had a crossover of the moving averages again in 2007, and a break of support suggested risk off to get out of the market. And in 2009, then you had a breakout and a crossover. This would be uh, the, the crossover up here is the death cross. Uh, 
terminology that's thrown around a lot in the industry. And then this would be a golden cross on the flip side where your shorter term, shorter term moving average crosses above your longer term. And you know historically it's the uh, 100 or the 50, 200 cross. This is a little bit different, uh, obviously. Uh, I'm using a little longer term moving averages to slow the crossovers down. Bottom line is last month, everybody, we do have a crossover in the upper right on the moving averages, but you can see that we don't have a sell signal because long-term support wasn't broken. So we have half of it there, but uh, support is support, and so there's been no sell signal for this uh, long-term crossover combo that we want to call. It was really close it, uh, a couple of weeks ago on an intraday, intra-week basis. It did push below it, but by the end of the week and the end of the month, it's back above support. One well, chart that I find uh, fascinating, and when I see uh, assets going in a different way, I call it a large fish mouth pattern. But uh, in the red's crude oil. We're going back a decade. In the black is uh, the S&P, and you'll notice they had a pretty decent correlation in moving both directions. From the 2009 lows, there's uh, quite an upside correlation. But the thing right in here in 2014 is once crude oil broke support, you know what essentially has happened to the S&P. You know, it's been in a, a five-year bull run, but once we saw a lot of weakness take place in crude oil, then just the flatness, the sideways chop has taken place in the S&P. So this is why uh, in the sectors report last week in the coffee, that I'm trying to focus and really look hard on potential reversal patterns uh, because, you know, here's the S&P on support in a sideways, above five-year support, it's on a sideways uh, support that if crude oil could start acting better, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see stocks, you know, improve. So uh, as we go back over a, a long time period, folks, we've, we've hardly ever seen a fish mouth spread this wide between crude and the S&P. Uh, out of this is going to be uh, become, I believe, some marvelous opportunities. We'll play a game of what if for a second, and let's look at uh, uh, the S&P over the last 20 years. Last year we started suggesting, you know, or let me just back up. This is the S&P where we took the 2007 highs, the financial crisis lows, applied Fibonacci. What does 161 mean? It's just taking 61% of this entire um, movement here and uh, applying that above. So this becomes an, what's called an extension level. And you'll notice once the S&P hit that extension level, which was essentially around uh, April, May of last year, just stopped on a dime. But this would be a what if, you know, uh, this would be a what if for the bulls. Is what if this past two years has been nothing more than an upper level consolidation forming a base to push much higher off of? Uh, we can't rule that out. We know from a fundamental perspective, margin debt, uh, the Buffett indicator, markets are still extremely lofty. But from a price perspective, this is a possibility. One of the things that doesn't excite me, regardless of how many bullish things we have going on you know, right now or at any given time, one thing that doesn't excite me right now is the overhead resistance of the 800-pound gorilla in the 2100 zone in the S&P. So there's nothing wrong uh, with being long the S&P, uh, participating in this rally, but from today's action, it's about 9% overhead. And if, if obviously, if we could capture 70% of 9, that'd be about a 6% gain. Nobody would be frustrated you know, with that, but this still is a little challenging that there's such heavy resistance overhead. So we're going to look at charts later on that, uh, that have, if we can uh, see green shoots and the market's moving higher, that have a lot more upside room before the 800-pound gorilla is, is knocking at the door. Because you can darn well bet if, if this S&P would continue to rise, all of the people that, uh, you know, uh, are frustrated that we're buyers up here over a year ago can turn into sellers at resistance. So we'll look at some uh, charts you know later on uh, that have a lot more upside than just a nine percent. I'm not trying to say that nine percent is capped. Obviously, if this 161 can get taken out, there's a lot of upside potential, especially after just moving sideways for two years. One of the things, one of the reasons, um, this is the transportation index that had gotten hit extremely hard. You'll notice a year ago the uh, transportation index was at the top of its five-year rising channel, uh, had a much larger uh, decline than the, the broad markets or the S&P. 
uh, over the, that year, but it did take it down to falling resistance. So one of the things that I just wanted to do is if I was going to go long, I wanted to really go long the road that was less traveled or the one that had gotten hit you know, the hardest. So um, transportations uh, have had a, they were up on the month, uh, I think six or seven percent, and uh, we bought them down here at uh, close to dual resistance or triple support, excuse me, at, at one, and we're seeing some nice push out of here. But when thinking about uh, prior resistance from last year, remember that the S&P, uh, the 2150 heavy resistance level is nine percent overhead. I'm not going to say it's, it's it, is, there's no assurities that it will happen, but if the markets would continue to rally, the, S, the transportation index could rally 22%, or in other words, over 100% more before it would go back to 2015 highs. So this is one of the reasons that I bought the transportation index, is because it had been hit harder, and then if we would get a, a rise to the upside, we'd probably make more money than the broad markets. So we'll see kind of this constant theme in some of the upcoming charts. But so far, for those that are along the transportation index, uh, nice movement coming off support and breaking falling channel resistance. 30-year bond, drill into that a little bit more. Uh, we, we looked at this chart earlier, but when you look at the 2008, 2012 lows, again, this is a monthly chart we did see in the uh, early part of 2015 that yields broke below it, and then they went back above it. So other than for one month's time period, on a closing basis, yields have stayed above essentially the 2.5% yield um, support line, and you'll see on a monthly basis that's quite a uh, bullish wick or reversal pattern that took place when it hit uh, support this past month, and this is where we started uh, shorting bonds when that was taking place. This is a closer look uh, now at TLT. You'll notice uh, going back over the last four years, Essentially, the 133 uh, areas of resistance line, you'll notice a couple, two different bearish wicks or reversal patterns have taken place twice in the last four weeks at this resistance line. Then you'll notice a steep support lines coming in, and TLT is now, uh, <coughs> excuse me, breaking uh, that support line. I don't know if any, any of you... Uh, or short bonds, you know, with me right now. One of the things I found interesting is it was a good day in the stock market, up a couple hundred basis points. But if you'd shorted TLT today, would you made any money, lost any money? Ironically, TLT was down almost, or really close to the same percentage that the S&P was up. So shorting bonds paid off almost as, as well as uh, longing the S&P 500 today. I know one day doesn't make a trend, uh, but the biggest uh, point here, folks, is that uh, stiff resistance uh, appears to be hit, a couple of bearish reversal wicks, and now TLT is breaking rising support. So that could be good for our inverse position. The inverse position on a, a 1x basis is TBF. So just real quickly, you can see that TBF tried to get below recently, and it did get below the 2015 lows. But you'll notice uh, a couple of the reversal wicks took place. Then here's a falling resistance. So from a TBF perspective, we have a, a breakout taking place above uh, dual resistance. Um, if we continue to, to uh, see TBF go up, I will uh, bring my stops up, and I'll try to put them in uh, probably pretty close to the 2250, 2270 range, which would be right below uh, this horizontal support line. So far, uh, decent action on the, the inverse bond play. One month ago, I uh, shared the power of what if, and this was uh, crude oil one month ago on a monthly basis, and you can see, uh, again, we've highlighted these uh, long-term 25- and 30-year potential support points, and this is uh, on a high-low close monthly basis. This was a month ago, so this was the month of uh, January, and by the time we did uh, last month's Connect series, Crude oil was already starting out the early part of uh, February on the wrong side, and you, so you can see that it was trading down. So kind of just remember this little piece mentally or visually, what took place, one big push below with a, a bullish wick, and it tried to get back above the support, but it didn't, and we highlighted what took place in February could be key. So this next chart you're going to see is going to look a lot the same, but it's updated, 
And so now you'll notice here is a, a couple of different large bullish wicks that took place and on a monthly basis crude held at this support line. And you'll notice this top support line was critical that three different times, three different months during the financial crisis, sellers tried to come in and, and break that line and it became support. Uh, not saying it'll happen again, but uh, uh, crude oil got down into the, the mid-30 range, uh, low 30s in 2009, and a couple of years later traded as high as 100. Be very surprised to see that happen again, but anything is possible, especially when we've seen some of the uh, largest extreme losses in the history of crude oil over an 18 uh, to 24 month time period. This is uh, the, so if we're looking for bottoming processes potentially, uh, when you think of the nine uh, S&P sector funds, uh, energy um, gets an award for not being above 2011 prices. It's the only one that can say that. Uh, it's not made any money since 2011, but you can see that it's, uh, excuse me, I'm going to get that back out of there. We have a 15-year rising channel, and you'll notice that uh, in 2005 and 7, uh, XLE was pushing up above it, broke above it, and then came down, used it as support, and then once below it, we have the financial crisis where it lost 50% of its value. Uh, it hit it again in 2014, but now XLE is at the bottom of this rising channel for the first time since the 2003 lows, and then also up above, if you'll notice, this is a weekly momentum that it's as oversold as the 2008-9 lows and as the lows in 2002 and 3, and it's actually spent as much or more time in an oversold uh, reading than the prior lows that we just mentioned in 2002-3 and 08 and 09. So I'm going to bring another chart in here. We're just going to look a lot closer or tighter. We're just uh, highlighting everybody this area that I'm circling with my mouse. And you'll notice that there's a potential of a uh, bullish ascending triangle. This pattern is um, uh, suggests a breakout to the upside six, two thirds of the time. And then from a measured move perspective, you can take the height of that pattern and flip it over. So if a breakout would take place uh, roughly around the 58, 50, 59 uh, level, uh, you could see that it could uh, rally another 10%, if not more, up to the 65 level. So um, very oversold. Uh, nobody likes it. Um, uh, we, we've all very well aware of how much oil uh, uh, surplus there seems to be in America. Uh, the states are exporting oil. There's tankers out in the ocean. And uh, a lot of people are calling for crude oil to go to $20 a barrel, where in 2014, they were calling 200 a barrel. So um, not many bulls here, understandably, uh, a lot of frustration, particularly when this ETF has fallen you know, so heavily. But this uh, smells of opportunity you know, in this area, and especially if crude could get going, these uh, stocks, you know, uh, channel resistance here on the right for everyone is around 65, but if it breaks above that, you can see it can have a, a lot of room to, uh, to run a, a good bit. So the energy complex, definitely interest me from a, a USO or crude oil perspective, but also energy stocks. <coughs> Excuse me. This is just a, one of the things that I wanted to look at as we've been talking about that the S&P maybe has resistance 9% overhead. So I wanted you just to, to think about this for a minute. If we took the highs in 2014 in XLE and the lows in 2015, and we did nothing more than say that energy stocks are still in a, a bear market and they're going to stay there, but what if energy stocks would rally and only recover 38% of the, of the decline from 2014 to 2016? XLE, the 38% FIB level, comes in uh, around 22% above uh, current prices. So um, that wouldn't be a bad gain. And again, uh, S&P resistance is 9% above. So this would be a possible play without even going back to all-time highs that if the markets would move up that could uh, provide some extra returns over and above the S&P. And obviously there's, the numbers are a lot higher. If it just retraced 50% of its level, that's up to the 75 level and it's trading around 60. So that's a, over a 30% you know, gain. So a lot of possibilities. And this is the areas that interest me uh, much more than the S&P 
until the S&P could uh, take out 2150. When the, this chart uh, overlays the interest sensitive aspects of uh, looks at TLT and utilities that have uh, both done well uh, and overlays it with the S&P. So one of the things that kind of interested me is you'll notice in the top uh, TLT, uh, this is a weekly pattern, has created some reversal wicks over the last four weeks at resistance. Utilities are up against channel resistance. They've been doing well and you'll notice uh, last week created a reversal pattern at resistance and at the same time the S&P has created two bullish reversal patterns at two-year horizontal support. So this is um, this is what uh, bottoms and tops can potentially look like and it's where they can get started and so what we're looking for is kind of confirmation from outside sources everybody and so if we would see continued weakness in the interest sensitive areas being TLT and XLU uh, that could probably has a chance to be positive for the S&P so I wanted you to see how you could see some potential topping patterns in the interest sensitive areas along with the bottoming power patterns in the S&P. Another area that from a macro perspective we just want to see, you know, could things uh, be improving and this is Doc Copper. This is copper on the left on a monthly basis, weekly in the middle, daily on the right. I provide uh, institutional research on a weekly basis to companies and I just kind of wanted to share, you some, share with you something I'm sharing with them. So this is monthly uh, momentum, you know, copper's done terrible over the last few years. So the monthly momentum is, is the most oversold in the last 35 years. In the middle chart, you can see weekly momentum's oversold. It's been down here before, and, and at times where copper was at a, a low, copper's made a little bit of a move up, so daily momentum's a little overbought. The key thing here to me is monthly and weekly is very oversold. And then we're going to drill down and look a little bit further on the next chart. <clears throat> but one of the things that interests me is if you take the lows in 2000, 2002 range, and the highs in 2011, that the decline that uh, copper has, has witnessed or experienced the last few years, uh, going from f over $4 to 2, that 50% decline, has copper trading at its 61% FIB level at the same time as at the bottom of this 15-20 uh, year rising channel. So what copper does here is something that can be very important for oil, for uh, Rio Tinto trades, for uh, Freeport McMoran, for Joy Global, so, um, for uh, IYM, the materials sector. So this is really important, uh, what copper does at this rising support. So we're going to drill down a little bit further. Here's copper over uh, the last 20 years. You can see this blue circle at, at the support line. <coughs> Excuse me. But let me drill in just a little bit tighter there's a chance that at this support line that copper is making an inverse head and shoulders. With the neckline, this is be $2, 210, 220. So just below between 215 and 220, you see copper's trading at 214. If this is a correct read, if this is an inverse head and shoulders off of a support, if it breaks the neckline, be good for copper. Uh, the, the copper uh, ETF is JJC, it would probably be good for there, and obviously there's a lot of ancillary plays that I just said that would probably profit from that. So uh, really key what happens if this is a correct read at this neckline, if this is a breakout, uh, I, I could suspect that a, a lot of things in the world would love to see copper do well from here on the long side. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize for my coughing, everybody. I've had some typical cold through the winter stuff here you know, lately. and uh, So this is gold monthly and you can see this is uh, the, the February rally. It took it up to uh, three year uh, falling channel resistance. So gold still remains in a downtrend. It, you know The metals have had a, a good year and so far in 2016 uh, leading commodities uh, from uh, if you eliminated GDX, gold is the number one I think commodity with silver not too far behind. What happens here at this resistance, it's been turned away each time over the last few years. Very important what gold does here. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Here's one of the things that why it's really important to me what gold does up against resistance is this is the uh, three week inflows from assets under management into the precious metals funds and you'll see that this is the largest push into this complex since 2009 and 2000 almost 11 and uh, these ended up particularly the 2011 was a, a very critical high for this complex so um, too many too fast too soon uh, this could be good if this would continue but we just need to see the metals complex break these uh, overhead uh, resistance lines here's the US dollar monthly uh, strong rally from 2014 but essentially we're the same price there everyone where we uh, where we were a year ago uh, the dollar got close to its 61 for percent fib level so that represents stiff resistance uh, just above the 102 uh, two level with support at 93 so it's trapped in almost a, a 10 percent range obviously what king dollar does if if, uh, if it breaks out uh, commodities don't have much chance of doing too well if the dollar could uh, head south uh, I would like that from a bias perspective because things are so oversold, <clears throat> oversold that it could really help commodities do well. Busy chart, but I just kind of wanted to show some uh, really high correlations. I sent all of this to premium members pre-market this morning. So we have crude oil on the top, emerging markets in the middle that's just been decimated uh, <coughs> for several years, and the Brazil's the worst of the three. Uh, EWZ, but you'll notice they they uh, they highly correlate in their patterns, and uh, each have hit a support line at almost the same time, and each are attempting to break resistance at the same time. So these are some plays that I shared with you before the market. Uh, even though the stock market was up, uh, you know, did a, had a nice day today. I think EEM uh, was up like 50% more than the S&P on the day. And I believe Brazil was up almost 100% above the S&P. So these are some uh, relative strength plays that have uh, gotten pounded hard that would uh, really interest me uh, on breakouts. Positive oil, positive for uh, EEM and EWZ, because obviously the, the opposite side's been that uh, low oil has caused these to hurt pretty badly over the last few years. So as we drill down to EEM, uh, if it would break resistance and uh, make it back to its 50% level, I know that sounds like really high. Chris, are you kidding me? This thing could it really rally that much? This is only the 50% level of a one-year decline, and the 50% fib level is 16%. You know, overhead. So uh, a breakout here would EEM could uh, take it to some of these fib levels, and that 16% uh, rally would be uh, about 60, 70% greater than the S&P getting into the 2150 level. Really key what it does here at the 23% Feb and falling resistance. This is um, the EEM S&P ratio and when this is going down it means the emerging markets are weaker than the S&P 500 and you can see the play for several years has been short EEM and long the S&P. Well now if you'll notice 2016 what's taking place in this rectangle is that we're seeing a series of higher lows and an attempted breakout which is reflecting that EEM is doing better than the S&P in 2016. So this is a positive uh, relative strength move taking place and this was what we would want to see if we're looking at trying to, uh, to buy into this really hard hit area. This is Brazil. You'll notice Brazil is uh, making a, an attempt today to break from falling resistance uh, coming off of uh, what falling channel support and if Brazil would do nothing more than just retrace 38 to the 38 percent retracement level of its uh, 18 month decline and it would if it would make it to the 32 33 dollar range 31 level excuse me that's 47 percent above current prices so even if it remains in a downtrend or a bear market that's obviously uh, almost a five-fold increase above uh, where the S&P's resistance comes in. So these are the trades that interest me the most, looking at a road less traveled that's been hit hard that has hot, more upside potential than the, the broad market itself does. And then here's the, uh, the ratio of Brazil versus uh, the S&P. 
Obviously, when it's falling, Brazil's been much weaker than the S&P, but you'll notice uh, similar to the other ratio of EEM versus the S&P, this ratio of Brazil versus the S&P, we're seeing a series of higher lows, and it's uh, moving up this year, which again, we're seeing a relative strength over the broad market. And if we see a breakout from this pennant pattern, it would be a positive message to be uh, long uh, Brazil over the broad markets. <clears throat> sugar, potential sweet pattern here. Um, SGG, the sugar ETF, it's only uh, declined from 110 down to a whopping 30. So we have over a 70% decline. Uh, it's interesting that sugar could be forming an inverse head and shoulders with the neckline uh, at the $35 range. So uh, if commodities could pick up, uh, sugar's had a, a, a good, uh, good month. What interests me the most is if it could get above this neckline, like I said, at $35, about 10% above current prices. If you take a measured move and look how far uh, this head is to the neckline and then turn that over, well, we're talking 35 to 50 bucks, which would be a, a big percentage. So we'll keep our eye on sugar. Um, it does have low volume, not a lot of trading, so I can understand if somebody says, Chris, it's not something that interests me, but I wanted to share uh, this pattern on sugar. Kind of flipping the table to the hottest product over the past um, uh, year to date and the past month is the, the gold stocks. Uh, some of you always kind of wonder, Chris, why do you show the XAU or the gold and silver index when nobody on the planet can trade it? A couple of the reasons is, uh, one, I'm an old dog, and uh, this is the oldest uh, uh, mining index on the planet. It's something that uh, I got into the business before this index even started in uh, 1980. So I've, I've watched it closely for my entire career, but here's just a couple of things. I like, you know, if you go to look at GDX or GDXJ, they don't have much history, so you can't go and do a performance study like this <coughs> over the last 30 years. The lower chart is um, rate of change, or let's just turn that around to performance, based upon this four is four week, or in other words, one month performance. And we saw at the start of this seminar that uh, miners had a heck of a February, and it pushed the four-week performance above the 40% level. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you look back over the last 30 years, there's only been three times that the miners have ever had that strong of a monthly performance. And so I think one of the interesting things that always amazes me is that despite uh, all of the, the gains in technology stocks from the, the late 90s, or the mid to late 90s, or the, excuse me, the mid 90s to 2000, you know, where the, the NASDAQ almost went vertical, the strongest rallies took place <coughs> from uh, 2000 to 2003 when the NASDAQ was falling 90% value. Hence, we've always heard the discussion of that oftentimes large rallies take place in bear markets. So 1987, stock market crash, Miners shot up, had a big four-week performance, but then they peaked around the 160 value and then went back down to 60. We can see in 1999, we saw another huge rally in miners. They peaked around 90 and fell to 40. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. <coughs> in the 2009, uh, after the financial crisis, we did see a strong rally in the miners, and they continued to go up. So we only have three cases of this hot of a performance over the, the last 30 years. Two of them saw the miners uh, fall back 60% in value, and in 2009, we saw the index go from 100 to 200, or 100% rally even after that happened. So uh, we're at a really critical point, in my humble opinion, in the miners. We can see this is where the XAU index was earlier. So now I'm going to convert it to something that we can trade or look at a little closer. This is the Gold Bugs Index, which is just purely gold mining. Uh, it's the HUI Index. This is kind of a, what attracts or gets my attention after a large rally. Is You'll notice that uh, the miners, despite this huge month up, the Gold Bugs Index still remains in a falling channel. This uh, potential bear, uh, short covering rally, which was huge, took it right to uh, rising or falling channel resistance. And then if we take 
the series of uh, lows here in 2003 and four and the financial crisis. And this is based on, on a monthly basis. You'll notice last month's rally came right up and hit resistance. <coughs> Excuse me. This is not a place, if you were long, that you would want to see a reversal pattern in miners take place after one of the strongest four-week rallies in history. Um, a little bit over a week ago, I uh, took out and I shorted GDX. And if I'm really interested in miners, everybody, if we can get a breakout here, it'd, it'd be fun because they're just so compressed. You know, this index, I mean, think about this, was at 700 in 2011, and it got down to 100. Pretty huge, huge hit. And so I, I'd love to see if this could break out. I, I, I'll, I'll follow it. I'll be very happy to do that. Uh, but I, I attempted um, to short up here, and I put a 4% tight stop, and I got uh, taken out. Lost 4% on the trade. But this is still a place that's uh, very much of interest to me to short up against resistance until a breakout takes place. This is GDX, uh, looking closer, and you'll notice uh, it's at the top of the falling channel. It's up against this red resistance line, and the rally that we've seen in 2016 has done nothing more than take it up to the, it's just recovered half of its uh, year and a half decline. So it's at the 50% level. At the top of the chart, you'll look at weekly momentum, and you'll notice once miners have peaked in 2011, when momentum in 2012 got to this level, that's when miners peaked out. You can see in 2014 they, they, they weren't quite as high as 12, but you'll notice that miners peaked then and we're back up there again. So this is a great place for a breakout if it takes place, but right now we have to, uh, for several years, you uh, want to short rallies up against resistance, and if uh, GDX would have a reversal pattern here, it just has a chance, folks, to be a pretty dangerous. So if you're long the miners and, and you participate in this rally, pats on the back, high fives all over the place, that's great. Um, if you're still long, I just uh, keep your stops up tight and uh, just you don't want to see a reversal pattern up here. I'm still interested if we see a reversal of, of shorting miners until a breakout takes place. U.S. dollar yen um, on a monthly basis. Again, this is a 30-year uh, resistance line coming into play. I, I get a, a great questions all the time, Chris, what the heck is it with the, the yen and the stocks? The bottom line is, is uh, this was 2007 when the yen peaked out at 125. The yen started heading south, and so did stock markets all over the world. There's a chance <clears throat> this is a head and shoulders topping pattern up against resistance. So when this is headed south, so have stocks. So for stocks to continue to do well, um, and especially to try to get past the 2150 level on the S&P, we need the uh, dollar yen to get past the 125 level. So if it does, that'd be uh, great for stocks. Uh, right now, that's pretty heavy resistance, and uh, do keep a, a close eye on the dollar yen. So in wrapping up, <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice uh, here. Um, these kind of three images came to mind. First is the global support has held on a monthly basis, and we're seeing some green shoots of growth taking place. The one-year trend, no doubt, is still down because we see a series of higher lows and lower highs. So the, the small trillion-dollar question is, do you buy the dips or sell the rallies? With um, support based upon the two-year sideways and the five-year rising, um, <clears throat> I'm interested in being a, a buyer down there, and I, I'd love to see some more positive action taking place. And as a thumb, the Fonz has two thumbs up. <clears throat> I like the action that we're seeing at support, you know, of late. I mentioned several times that the 2150 and the S&P is about 9% overhead. So, you know, I'm more interested in what it would do beyond 2150 if it ever could get above that. So I'm interested in buying like we did with uh, the transportation stocks, trying to buy things that have been the hardest hit. We've covered and discussed Brazil and um, emerging markets you know, today, and on the flip side, shorting assets that are up against resistance that are hot. We're short bonds you know, right now, and if we see some continued weakness in the miners, I'll go back to shorting you know, there. So I, uh, I'm always appreciative of, of your membership, your time. Um, thank you for uh, being on the webinar, and if not, just listening to it you know, at your, your own discretion. 
time seems to fly, uh, so we'll see you on the Connect series a, a month from now, the first Tuesday uh, in, in April. And uh, again, I, I wish all of you well and, and blessings to you and your families. Thanks so much. Bye.